things for a living. He had a prophetic anyway. word about me being a better preacher. So just oh, she wanted me to put that online that she's a better preacher. Yeah. <laughs> Occasionally she Tell does do me. good. <laughs> so it's a very simple prophetic word. I felt like God was going to uh, said while we were worshiping that he's going to right wrongs. Yeah. Okay. And I think some of you have been going through some, injust some justice issues. Some things have happened. That's why I started out with life isn't always fair. All right. Some of you have been going through some things that have, uh, it's definitely uh, a series of events that you just felt ripped off. Okay. And I'm here to tell you, God's going to right some wrongs. All right. Because his divine power is going to move on your behalf. And there is the weight of his authority that's going to get behind some systems that have been in I mean, just unjust is the only way I can explain it. So, very simple. God's going to right some wrongs. All right. So, there you go. If that fits your circumstance, hang on to it. It's got handles. It'll pull you through. All right. Amen. Cindy Lou. She's first. Women's first. It's always that way. <laughs> In my house. No. We know that's not true. Well, I have some things I think are going on, so... I never know what's going to, I had this meme I was going to put up today that said, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth until it's too late and I've already said it. So um, here's, uh, you know, we're, we're all uh, wondering, I think, and, and it seems like every step, every day we get up, we're like, what on earth? Like, what's going to happen? What's going to be the outcome? Especially with the election and all the different things going on. And, and what I felt like I heard this morning is that God is in prep mode. He's in prep mode for us. In other words, there's a lot of things that are stalled. There's a lot of things he could do right away quickly. But what he's doing is he is getting us ready for what's coming. And so if we can get our mind around that, and we realize that, you know, there's two scriptures that came to my mind. One was in Hosea uh, 10 that said, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, Reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness on you. That's the first one. Break up your fallow ground. How many feel like you've had fallow ground? Or how many feel like, I mean, don't even feel, how many just know, flat out know, that the church has had fallow ground? I mean, we have just been flatlined, you know, let's, where's the next big conference? Where's the next carnival? Where's the next whatever? And God never, it's, it's, I love what Pastor Troy said. He said the church was never designed to be a cruise ship. We're a battleship. Yeah. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why he didn't shut the doors. That's why he knew that at a time like this, when it was so crazy and things were going all over the place, it was time for the church to come together and to press in and press forward and to not allow um, yourself to become complacent and, and just relax, you know. And so it's time for us to break up fallow ground and seek the Lord. And when we do that, he'll come and he'll rain righteousness on us. Which then, and then over in Jeremiah 15, it says that if you will, um, if you will, separate the precious from the vile or from the worthless. Then, he said, I think it's Jeremiah 15, 19 and 15, 20. Then I will make you a fortified wall of bronze and they will come against you, but they won't be able to defeat you. So there's a prep process going on. And the prep process always happens before a huge victory. There's something that God wants to get us into to where we take note of our own selves. We take note of what God has for us to do. He t we take note of the fact that he's saying, look, I see the future. I know what you're headed into. I know what this is going to look like. I know what the outcome is going to be. So therefore, 
I want me, my kids, I want my bride to be listening to me and going through whatever process or prep mode needs to happen so that when we're on the other side of this, there'll just be another something that will come up. How many know that? You're never going to be without obstacles. You're never going to be without challenges. Things are never going to just fall into your lap, you know, and all these things. The kingdom of God suffers violence. But we, the church, are violent, and we press in and break into its possibilities, and we break in and we take hold of the gold. And that's what we do. And so we've never, we've never really embraced the fact, I guess I'll speak for myself, Tim and I have never embrace the fact that we'd have it easy. Nothing we've ever done in ministry has been easy. It's always been something. We've, we've always been forerunners. We've been the ones to go before. We've been the ones that, that, that don't know what we're doing 99% of the time. 99.9% .9 of the time, we don't know what we're doing. However, God said, I just want you to do it. I'm not asking you to know all about it. I'm just asking you to go forward. I'm asking you just to take the lead. Take the chance and see what, what he'll do for us. So right now, we're in preparation mode. God is in prep mode with us. So our, our point, part right now is to pray, is to allow God to do whatever he needs to do. Our job is to break up our fallow ground. Okay, we all know what that is. Where have you been lazy? Where have we been lazy? Where have we not been willing to? Where have we felt like, you know, well, you know, God's big and he can do it. Well, yeah, you know, but you didn't even get saved like that. You had to take action in order to get saved, right? He didn't just fall on you and all of a sudden you're saved and you said nothing and you did nothing and you made no uh, attempt to change your life. So God is now asking us to do something. What is he asking us to do? He wants us to separate the worthless from the precious, the vile from the precious, separate it out. And that'll be one of those things where it's just you and God. It's just you and God. What is it that you want out of us? How do you want us to position ourselves? What do you need us to go through? What is the prep mode that you want us in right now for where you're taking us? where things are going to be in three weeks or a month or two weeks or whatever. What is it that you want us to do? Because God's raising up an army. And that's the truth. He's raising up a bunch of people that won't just roll over and let anything come over and take us and take our freedoms and take whatever stuff, you know, the enemy's trying to do. Satan's already conquered. He's a defeated foe. He doesn't have any ability. He doesn't have anything. The only way he's going to win or that he's going to lord over us is if we shrink back in fear. And people aren't doing that. People right now are not doing that. They're like, no, it's not going to happen. You know, I'm not shrinking back in fear. We have an assignment. We have something that God wants us to do. And we have a way that he wants us to do it. And in the meantime, he's also putting his heart inside of our heart. So the more that we break up fallow ground and we sow to ourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy, that's what it says, reap in mercy. God is merciful. He is full of mercy. And he wants us to understand that he is, while he's asking us to break up stuff that has been complacent or we've allowed ourselves to become hardened, He's merciful in the process of helping us even do that because he's a dad and he's not going to allow us just to do this on our own, just to go out there and suffer. You know, I hate that when people say, oh, just sweat it out before God. Well, you know, God is like, he's great. I mean, spending time with him is not sweating it out, in my opinion. I mean, I just think that God's got this, and he knows how he wants us to do this. But what he's asking us to do now is he's saying, I need for you to separate out what's vile from the precious. Do an exam on, your, on yourself. Do an exam on everything that you've, taught, you've been taught, you've been walking in, everything, because everything is seasonal. What you used, what you were, how you thought, how you understood in the last in the last little bit is not going to be the way that you will be. 
And the other thing, too, is, is that I've always remembered for myself that whatever you've overcome, whatever authority, whatever you've overcome, you have authority over. Whatever it is you've overcome, you have authority in that area. And God will use you there. Yes, he will. And he will use you with power and might to break others free. To break chains off of people and to bring them out of darkness and into light. So when we're doing this, when we're in this season right now where we don't know, one day, stop, I had to stop watching the news. You know this. I already told you that, I think. Or if I didn't, I'm telling you now. I had to stop because, and I'm watching like all the ones that I thought probably would say the best thing because I can't trust any of them anymore. I don't know what. To, so I stopped doing it, and he was like, I, I felt like God was like, well, thank you. <laughs> Finally, right? Because well, I was getting stressed out. Like, how can everybody be so stupid? How can they not know, you know? And I'm listening to the lawyers and listening to this and that, and I'm like, how can they not? What do you mean? There's no, what do you, there's no evidence, you know? And, and I finally turned it off, and God went, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Because he is the just judge. He knows exactly what he's got in store for us. Listen, Jesus is still Lord. He's Lord when there's been righteous rulership and when there's been unrighteous rulership. He's still Lord. And I tell you what, there's a whole lot of things that are getting ready to break open and come to light and be exposed. And he's going to be still Lord. And the good part is that we, his kids and his bride, are going to be already through the prep process to get us in alignment with what he has for us to do. Because then we will volunteer willingly, it says, in the day of his power. Your people volunteer willingly in the day of your power. And the day of his power is coming like we have never seen it before. So this is good, good stuff. So don't allow your prep process to defeat your outcome. It's just a prep process. If you go in the kitchen, I was thinking about that. Actually, that's really the vision that I had in my head is ingredients, like for a recipe. And you see them all lined out on the counter, and you know that they're all, they all serve a purpose, but it doesn't look like cookies until you put it in the mixer and put it on the cookie sheet and put them in the oven, and then they taste like cookies, right? So but all the ingredients are there. It just doesn't look like what it's going to be when you get it all together. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing bits and pieces and bits and pieces and bits and pieces. And we're having to walk carefully, you know, through situations that are going to bring us to our outcome, to our end that is, that is going to be so fruitful when we get there. And then we'll have another challenge. And God doesn't stop taking you through prep process. How many know that? But you're, we are all in prep process now for this season for what we're doing now and what we're coming into now. And then there'll be something else that God's going to have us prepare for. So in the meantime, we continue to go forward. We do not lose heart in doing good. He said you'll reap if you don't get weary, if you don't faint. You have to run the race to get the prize. And cheaters never win. I can, I can say that. Cheaters never win. You win it, you run it because you ran it the right way. And you ran it with integrity and with honesty. And, and there is always a fallout at the end if it's a cheated race. doesn't matter what it is, what kind of race it is. You ask any athlete on any field with track or any, any kind of race, doesn't matter. Relay race, the Olympics, you just watch them. If, if they cheat, they don't win. Even if they're perceived a winner and they find out that they cheated, they don't win. Because God isn't mocked. 
So we now have to position ourselves with Jesus. We have to say, this is how you want us to go through this. Now, there's more to it than just what we're coming into. There, because God is strengthening his army. And he's strengthening us to do a certain thing. And he's saying, I've got some, I've got some new things for you to engage in. And I'm looking for leaders. I'm looking for people who won't give up. I'm looking for people who won't quit when it gets hard. I'm looking for people who will call out to me in the day when you don't know what's going on, in the day of trouble. I'm looking for leaders that I can put my weight on. I'm looking for people who will say, I'll do it. Even if you don't know how, or you don't know why, or you don't know what it's, or what you're going to encounter. And you have to know that God is your protector, and he's going to keep you safe. If he tells you to do something, he's not going to just withhold protection from you. He's not. And that's why it's important to really listen to what he wants us to do. You know, I, I'm an outreach creator. I'm an evangelist, but I'm an outreach creator. And everything this year has been messed up. Every kind of outreach that we used to do is not available to us. So we're having to reform and restructure and, and listen to God as to how do you want us to, to reach people who are desperate to hear a message, but we can't get near them because we have to have a six-foot rule. And we're masked up. And we're screaming muffled sounds toward one another, especially with dream interpretation. Give me a break. What? Nobody can hear each other. Finally, we both just take our masks down and just talk. But this is, this is what we're having to do. Now, we have to restructure everything we're doing. But, the, but about probably September, God told me, he said, he said I'm not, you're not raising up outreach teams. Maybe it, was, maybe it was June or July. He said, you're not raising up outreach teams anymore. You're raising up an army. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to raise up an army of people and have regional directors all over our nation. My heart's for this country. I do, I do ministry all over the world. I've been all over the world, and I love it. But my heart has always been with America. It's always been with our country. And I was having a little bit of a, I mean, I'll just be dead honest. I was having problems with seeing so many people, well, we're going overseas and we're going over here and we're going and doing that and doing this. And I'm like, what about us? Really? What about our own kids, man? We got a whole generation of kids that are God-hardened. They don't even know if there is a God. And half of them think, you know, they're atheists. I mean, you go on a university campus, you go to a high school, you start talking to them in King James English about God. They're going to shut you down. They're not going to listen to what you have to say. And we have a whole generation of people without standards, without a moral compass, without any kind of foundation underneath them. They don't even know what it, what's real. They don't know what's real. They've been told by every kind of rock star what's real. You know, to the point where you have, you know, um, J-Lo at the Super Bowl game last year pole dancing. And that's supposed to be a role model for young girls? I go into the sex industry. Come on. There's not a whole lot of difference. So I'm like, church, army, people that don't think that's right, I need you. I need you. I need you because we're going to make a difference and we have a voice and we're going to state, state what we know and we're going to make changes in the lives of people, even if it's one by one by one by one. And it's not just that industry. It's any kind of, I mean, the philosophies of men have cheated people out of the gospel. That's what they're learning in college. The philosophies of men, they're not even learning the real truth. They don't even know our history. They don't know the Constitution because they're not taught it. You know, we had a different experience in school. We had people, and in, in, we were in a God, a, we were just after, we were in the baby boomer age, right? So we had the opportunity for prayer to be still in school, for teachers to teach the historical. I had a guy who was my teacher, my history teacher, when I was a junior, and he was from San Saba, Texas. 
And he knew the whole history of all the different battles that took place. And he made it so interesting because he understood it. it he lived it. And, and I remember thinking, this is the best history class I've ever had. And I got A's and B's because he made it interesting. It wasn't just nonsense. But now we have, we have a prep going on inside of us on how is it that God wants us now to communicate with a bunch of people that don't have any concept of him. That don't have any understanding of what our nation is about. That think everything is free and everything is a handout. You know, I've been, we've been in ministry. We've pastored four different churches. We have birthed two or three of them, three of them, I think, from the ground up. And it's like we, we have been in ministry for since 75. Tim started in 75. I started in 70. He got saved in 72. I got saved in 73. We went to Bible school, and then we st he started ministry in 75. So we've been in the ministry thing for a long time with churches, but I've been in counterculture for 25 years outside the church, which isn't planet Christian. You talk about a shake up and a wake up. I mean, I was like, oh my goodness, I had no idea people thought this way. I had no idea that people thought what they do. I didn't know that they thought everything was free. I had no idea that they have no, they think, they don't think that there is a, a supernatural being or a supreme being. They think beings are supreme. And they tell you that. There's no supreme being. Beings are supreme. That's called humanism. And I was like, really? Well, where did you come from? I mean, how come you're so uniquely different than everyone else? Or did you just create yourself? Did you think all that stuff up? And they're like... And I remember Wiki Prattney. He was one of my teachers years ago. And he, he, did, he drew a big pizza on the board. And he said to people that were agnostic or atheist, and he, he took a slice of the pizza out, Right? And he goes, so here's what you understand according to your thinking. Here's what you understand. Then is it possible with this slice of pizza that is gone, is it possible that God could exist? And they go, well, there are no absolutes. And he'd go, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> and so we are up against a battle right now. But in order for us to be clear-minded and have methods and understanding and structure and, a, and a blueprints and a new way of thinking and a new understanding of how God wants us to reach a generation that God is foreign to them, then we have to be prepped. We have to be in preparation mode. And we have to be ready and get it down. I'm being challenged right now by a really good friend of mine. She said, your stories are great, but you got to get that outline solid, man, for the training. And you got to have the scriptures to go along with it. And I'm thinking, I hate doing that because I know they're going to change. But she said, this is the way it has to be solid. And then we can wing off of that. So I'm having to... to as a visionary, here's how we work, just so you know. How many are visionaries in here, right? You fly from 32,000 feet, right? And it's very hard for you to bring it all the way down into this little teeny tiny thing. You start shorting out. It feels like if your plane were to lose altitude, it starts shaking really bad, you know? And you're like, I don't think that way. I don't know what you're talking about. But I'm having to learn how to do it because I have to be able to communicate to an army what the steps are for reaching a post-Christ era, a post-Christ generation, a post-Christ world. They don't think he's real. And this is in every counterculture movement I've been in. 
They do not think Jesus is real. And if they do, they think he's the problem. They think he's the problem and he's the reason why all this bad stuff is going down. It's his fault. And years ago, I had the privilege, Tim and I both did, of sitting under some of the greatest people. We, they're, they're, they're generals and they're champions today, right? But one was David Wilkerson, and he, he talked about this. He said, one of the last real big deceptions that will come upon the church and come upon the world, really, the world more than the church, will be that Satan will try and convince the world of everything he's doing is what Jesus is doing. He'll trade job descriptions with Satan. Or Satan will trade him with Jesus. So in other words, the thief comes, but to kill, to steal, and destroy. And Jesus comes as the healer, the one who gives you life, the restorer. But, but Satan would try and deceive many with that mixed up. So they think Jesus is the one. God is the one. He's the reason for the floods. He's the reason for the fire. He's the reason for the famine. He's the reason for the destruction. He's the reason for this. He's the, that's why Jesus said, hey, you'll be hated by all men because of me. You're going to be hated by all men. That's why I'm in my army, in the army that God's training me to teach, he, you know, I'm telling you, they don't think you're okay. So we have to be wise as serpents. We have to be harmless as doves. And we have to come a different way and begin to breathe life and let them get a taste and see that the Lord is good. And go around all their walls and all their stuff and everything that they think and all the way they've perceived and all the things they've done and the way that they talk and all this and you separate yourself out and you're in God's prep mode, right? He's prepared you. And now you listen to how he wants you to communicate with people who don't know how to listen to church talk. It's a really great experience. And trust me, I had to prove it. You know, you go out into Burning Man, into a place like that, where there's 85,000 people and they're all movers and shakers. These are, these are the... Um, influencers that influence culture and they go into that and they're com I had to learn a completely different language in order to communicate with them but they got saved they felt his presence by the end of their encounter they knew who it was their heads went back the Holy Spirit was all over them they got rocked by God they understood there is a creator and he is the lover of their heart and they would say, I feel like my head is clear, my lungs are open, I feel like 500 pounds fell off my back. I feel like I can live again. I'm not, I don't feel like I want drugs. I don't feel like I want to get stoned. I don't feel like, and we said, yes, this is called a new life. And on our menu board, there was organic restart. Welcome to your new life. And all they had to do was come into our camp and get an encounter with the spirit of truth. So I'm just telling you, we are in prep mode right now. God is prepping us for something greater than we've ever known, something bigger than we've ever seen, something different than we've ever done. And we've got to be ready to go when he says go, right? I'm not missing this for a, I will not miss this. I won't. I'm not missing this. Man, I've lived my whole life for this. I have. I've lived my whole life for this revival. I'm not missing it. I'm going to watch these, these smart in their own eyes, wise in their own eyes. I can go in. I've been, I used to do um, Bible studies in Hollywood, in Hollywood Hills. And I had people in my Bible study that I had no idea were even big deals. Because I don't know them. I did Sundance Film Festival where people were walking up and down the streets and they were A-list actors and I had no clue who they were. I had to Google them. Someone would say, oh, that's Mandy Moore. Well, who's that? I didn't know. 
You know, I knew my age ones, like Sally Field and different people like that. I knew Robert Redford. But I didn't know some of the newer ones. Oh, that's Coolio. That was at the adult convention. <laughs> he came up and spun the wheel. And I went, that's Coolio. And I went, gangster's paradise? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay. Well, that was cool then. Oh, Coolio. <laughs> so all I'm telling you is that we have these great opportunities right now. I, I can't wait. I'm excited. And I'm, I'm already putting out the net, man. Who wants to be in the Army? Who wants to be in it? Because we're not going to do things same church way. It ain't going to happen. Because we're not reaching people that are churched. So we have to use different ways, okay? All right. Tim's coming up. You ready? I knew that you came up here to say it's your turn. I didn't do that. I don't know how many people. Who are we talking to, by the way? They're on there. <laughs> I never know who these people are. Friends. Yeah, friends. You know, um, so this whole Facebook thing, so my daughters decided I needed a life, so they uh, set me up with Facebook. The only difference is they didn't tell me about it, and so they began to live vicariously through my Facebook. And so um, I, uh, I began to get information kind of third person back of things that I said, and I uh, was like, no, no, that's not, no, no, that does sound like Wait a minute. So, anyway, two or three months after this whole adventure for them, I don't know how many people I've offended around the world, but they had a really good time, I guess. Finally, I got a hold of the Facebook, redid the uh, password so they couldn't get in it, and I didn't know how to work it, so um, I was friend. People would come up and say they'd want to be my friend, so I had all kinds of friends. I didn't realize the industry that those people were in. I just thought, you know, they were part of the church. They weren't. And so, uh, anyway, it got to be a little crazy, so I thought, you know, this is not good for me. So, off I went. Um, hey, so we're going to talk to, I'm going to kind of shift it just a little bit from Evangelism 101, or 201, uh, over to the season that we're living in. I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about the Holy Spirit. How's that? Um, one of the things, you know, I, uh, I teach the soap class before we come in here, and so we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and about His operation and work within the lives of the believers and the church, etc. So one of the components that I have grown to love so much about the presence of God is the mystical side to God. You know, and for so long within the church, we've, we have created a theology that we have defined as intelligent. It's intelligent theology. It's reasonable theology. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't love God with our mind, because, I mean, I've got volume. I love theology, all right? You just take a look at my library. But there's this other side to God that is just out there. And it's in, it's in that place that we see God through a different lens and we experience God in a different way. And we, um, and we can watch his activity with a different set of eyes. And so I want to talk to you just a little bit tonight. So just if you would, uh, just imagine yourself. We're no longer in the encounter service. We are in Bible school. All right. How's that? And so we're just going to take it a little different direction. So I want to ask a question because I would do this in our class. And I want some participation from the audience. All right? That means you can't stay silent. So I want to ask you a question. What is the first experience or the first evidence or the first manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? Anybody? 
First one. What's that? Can't hear you. Tongues, okay. First one. Jesus baptism. Holy Spirit, yeah, that's that'd be Genesis. We're in the New Testament. Virgin birth. How many did you hear that? All right. So the first manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament was Mary. All right. Now here's here's why I'm, I'm bringing this out. All right. Not just because it's Christmas. Because when somebody's pregnant, okay, do you know, uh, I want to say maybe back in the 50s and the 60s, um, on television, they couldn't even say that a woman was pregnant on TV. They would say they are what? Expecting. All right? They're expecting. And so <clears throat> Mary had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And the outcome of that encounter with the Holy Spirit was she was expecting. All right? Here's what I want to tell you. As, you know, over a period of time, I actually, I come down to this room early. I don't know what there is about this room, but there is a peace in this room that just seems to stay. And so I come down here, and, and it's quiet. Nobody's around here, and I just get in here. But over, over a period of time, as I've been praying down here, I begin to feel this expectation rising up on the inside of me. I have felt this periodically over the years, and it's just, it's subtle, all right? And then I notice another thing that's been happening is that we're encountering more and more people who are having dreams that they're pregnant, all right? And I thought, hmm, that's a little weird. So, I mean, women who are beyond the childbearing years or they're not capable of giving birth are having dreams that they're pregnant and they're carrying something and they're getting ready to deliver. Here's what I think is going on. I think God is creating expectation in his people's heart because the, the first initial evidence of the introduction of the Holy Spirit into the new covenant community was expectation. A young teenage girl is expecting a child, and there's no evidence to support it other than a word. All right. Um, I've got my notes here. What is it? It's uh, Psalms 33.22. I want to read that for you. Psalms 33.22. Um, they asked me to send my notes in early so they could put them up on the overhead. And uh, the problem is, is that my notes changed two or three times. And so if I was to send these in, that would be totally different than what we're doing tonight. So just put up with me. How's that? Psalms 33 and verse, oh, here it is. Okay. This is 33, 18. It says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope for His loving kindness. That's very important. So the eyes of the Lord are pulled towards those who have an expectation. Right? So when we take a look at the Hebrew word for hope, it always is... It, it, it gives the idea, or leaves you with the impression, that is an expectation of good for the future. Right? So hope is an expectation. Verse 19, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits expectantly for the Lord. He is our help and He is our shield. For our heart rejoices in Him, verse 21, because... We trust in His holy name. Verse 22, here's the clincher. Let Thy loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in Thee. So, 
Basically what I feel like the Lord is saying, in the Amplified Version says, Lord, let your loving kindness be upon us in proportion to our expectation. So when we talk about God's loving kindness, we're talking about His covenant faithfulness. We're talking about the promises of God. It's everything that He has listed out here in front of us that's ours because of what Jesus did at the cross and the promises that He put in motion and the things that He has spoken into our heart personally. So our part to play in this whole entire process is expectation. So what does expectation look like for you? One of, the, uh, one of the guys I had the privilege of working with, he was the first pastor. I was a youth pastor in his church. This was right out of Christ for the Nations. He grew up in the mountains of Hazard County, Kentucky. And I mentioned it sometime earlier, but his dad was uh, worked in the coal mines and um, he made whiskey. <laughs> Moonshine, that's right. <clears throat> He said he could get more for the gallon than he could the bushel, talking about corn. So, he was a businessman. Anyway, um, when he was growing up, I mean, they were, it was poverty. It was Kentucky poverty up there in the mountains. And it wasn't just uh, Jim and his brothers living there. It was his cousins. It was just, I mean, it was like two or three families shoved into a small space. But... Um, their favorite time of year was Christmas, for obvious reasons. And the dad would bring home a Spiegel's catalog. And uh, the kids would get to go through a certain section of the catalog, and they would circle what they wanted for Christmas. And they would watch their dad uh, go through, catalog all the stuff that they wanted, mark it off on the order blank, and then they would, he would put a check of some sort, some kind of payment, I'm assuming it was a check, and they would stick it in the mail. And the kids, every day, lived in rampant adrenaline expectation because they knew any day something was going to come in the mail. Right? So I heard that and heard various stories that he talked about. But to me, that just spoke of what I feel is wrapped up in that verse. It is, it, is a, it is something that doesn't originate in our emotions. It affects our emotions. It's something that's born of the presence of God because it's an expression of the nature and the character of God. God doesn't have a lot of faith. He is faith. And when He begins to show up, there is a sense of expectation that begins to rise in our spirit. And it's a confidence, and, we, and you can't really give explanation for it, but there's an inner persuasion and an inner knowing that any day something's going to show up in the mailbox. Right? So that's what I felt strongly tonight, that as we're, we're moving into a season of time, and as the presence of God increases, because it is, all right, the presence of God is increasing, we can begin to expect, number one, an expectation rising on the inside of us, all right? Second thing, number two, uh, Luke's gospel. Let's go over to the birth of John the Baptist. This is actually, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most encouraging stories in the New Testament was, was how all of this unfolded, because this is the beginning of miracles. Jesus said of John the Baptist, um, he was, this is the greatest prophet that's ever, you know, there's not a greater man than John the Baptist. And so, you know, you look at John the Baptist's life, and it seems like, you know, you got Elisha, and Elisha, and he's, and he's greater than all that. So there's something about this story and, uh, and this event in history that I think, I don't know, it touched my heart. Um, see if I can find it here. Uh, verse 1 uh, of chapter, excuse me, yeah, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Inasmuch 
as many have undertaken to complete an account of the things accomplished among us. Now the thing I like about Luke, right, there's a lot of things, but one of them is that Luke was a doctor. So his approach to, you know, to the things of God is very structured, very precise, and very ordered. He's always dealing with order. The book of Acts, I'm setting out an orderly account for the things that we've experienced and the things that we've encountered. So for people who borderline obsessive compulsive, they're drawn to Acts and Luke, I think. It's just like the idea of everything being so wonderfully ordered. That's Luke. And he's setting out an account for us. It says, just as uh, those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed uh, them down to us. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated, there it is, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order. O most excellent Theophilus. Some Greek guy. Verse 4, so that you might know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, and it goes through this, verse 6, and they were both righteous, talking about um, uh, Elizabeth and, I never forget, what what's his name? Zacharias. Alright. Zacharias, they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. And they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. So, you know, any of you who are familiar with uh, uh, the Hebrew culture, one of the most important, uh, I want to say, barometers of God's favor and blessing upon your life was children, because they were given a commandment to multiply and replenish the earth. In fact, there's a lot of people that believe that the Apostle Paul had been married at one time because if you were a Pharisee, you had to be married in order to fulfill that commandment. Right? So this whole thing of childbearing and childbearing, it was just, it was a major issue in the Jewish culture. So here you have a couple, he's a high priest, and as far as the community is concerned, as far as the favor of God goes, it's not there for them. And so, who knows how long they prayed, year after year after year after year. They had an expectation in their heart that God was going to meet them and heal and restore so they could potentially and possibly have an heir and pass on through their name and through their family line an expression of the eternal God. And it never happened. I'm wondering in the room here tonight, how many of you have entertained promises, dreams, desires, year after year, and it just hasn't happened? I think what happened with these two um, is that they just finally had to adjust their expectation to reality. For them, it's obvious that they're well past the child bearing years. Verse 7. They had no child. Verse 8. Now it came about while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division. According to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. It was like a roll of the dice. The, the the fact that he was there, he was like one out of I don't know how many uh, that should have been in that place. It was just a roll of the dice. He, his name came up. So he's in there and he's burning at, uh, incense, which is a type of worship and prayer. Israel's outside while he's in there and they're making their prayers as he's burning the incense. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right of the altar of incense. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw him and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, 
and you will give him the name John. I would imagine at that point of the encounter, this had little or nothing to do with his faith. He had res resolved within himself years probably prior to that time that this was an experience that they would never have. They would never experience the joy of raising a young child. And so here an angel shows up at the most inopportune time on one hand and brings news that the prayers that they've prayed that he's long forgotten about have come before the God of heaven and that their petition and their desire, all of those tears and all of that intercession that transpired for weeks and weeks and months and years. It's finally now time. I believe we're in such a time as that right now, where there's people within church who have interceded to pray. It might be for a loved one. It could be for a ministry. It could be a lot of things. I want to tell you about an encounter I had. I felt was the Lord. Um, I was, uh, this was, uh, our previous pastor where we were uh, senior leaders and uh, I had a dream and in this dream I was in a doctor's office and the woman doctor was in there and she had uh, two patients in there and they were from our church. I didn't recognize them but but I knew, you know how you know things intuitively, alright, but they were in there and uh, they had developed a process where, where women who were past the age of bearing children, they could be hooked up to, it's almost like a chemical drip, and it would revitalize their reproductive uh, areas, and they could bear children. All right, so I'm standing behind this thing, and, uh, and then, you know, it's happening. All right? And there's joy on their countenance because they know that they are now going to be able to bear children that they thought they'd never have. Scene two, I'm in our sanctuary, and there's a woman in our church that I know very well. She was a friend of ours. She's standing in front, and the church is packed, and she's head over the child evangelism program. At that time, she had just gotten saved. She'd been there maybe a short period of time. I came out of this experience, and the Lord told me, this is especially for ladies, that there are uh, a lot of ladies uh, who had dreams in their heart of ministry and of um, influence that they let go of the dream because it seemed like the time has passed. They dreamed and they dreamed and they hoped and they hoped and finally they just let it go. But God said, I'm the great physician. And I'm going to restore the years that the palmer worm, the kangaroo worm was eating. And their dream is going to come to pass. So I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know where you're at in your, you know, in your heart of hearts concerning your place of usefulness in the body of Christ or what you perceive as God's calling for your life. But I think we are getting ready to step into a season where God is going to right some wrongs and he's going to bring justice, he's going to balance the scales, and things are going to begin to live and not die any longer. All right, so I'm, I'm in a sense prophesying this, but I'm mixing my faith with it with you. We want to believe God to demonstrate his goodness in the land of the living, right? We're, we're going to get it in heaven. I need it down here. I need to see a revelation of his faithfulness and his goodness right now, right here, in an expanded manner. Um, oh, I got one other thing. Um, well, camera's going down. All right, here's, here's what I want to say. Let's just do this. God said, my loving kindness is going to come in proportion to your expectation. What I'm asking you to do is I want you to hope again. I know things did not turn out the way you expected, 
but I want you, because that's the hardest thing sometimes for people to do, is to set themselves up for potential disappointment. It's just not there. But I want you to trust God and, and, and step out one more time and release your expectation tonight because we're going to pray together and we're going to release the power of God upon your dream, upon this thing you carry. And we're going to see if God doesn't burst something new and fresh on the inside of you in this season. How's that? All right, let's stand.